Well, good morning, church. It is a blessing to be here with you this morning. Church, I got to tell you, after a disappointing last winter, I am guilty of uh, praying for snow, and snow was we're delivered, <laughs> and we're going to get it again, and I'm ready. I'm ready. I, give me like 10 more of these this winter, and I'll be, I'll be happy. Um, I, I, all day Wednesday, I was in my glory. Every like 30 minutes, I was getting up from my desk and walking to the door and opening it and looking out for a couple, se couple well, I said seconds, but more like a couple minutes and just being like, yes, keep coming. And then, <laughs> and then when it turned to rain, I wanted to cry. But of course, we didn't get as much as they said we would. But I've learned in the last 10 years that we're never going to. But uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's good to be here with you this morning. Nonetheless, I was bummed to miss the Christmas hymn sing. But uh, it was nice to have a, a snowy, quiet evening on Wednesday night. But uh, church, as we begin this morning, would you just pray with me as we focus our hearts on the, the meaning of the Advent season this morning? Father, as we celebrate this Christmas Sunday, as we prepare our hearts to worship you right now and to focus on what this Advent season means for us, not just during this month or so that we celebrate it, but what the truth of this season means for us always and how it impacts our lives, would you just quiet and settle our hearts right now, Lord? Would you just prepare our hearts to worship you, a God who saw us in our desperation, who saw us in the most hopeless situation imaginable. And where there was no way, you made a way. And that is what this season is genuinely all about. The fact that your son came and made a way where there was no way. And with a cry of our hearts be to hail the newborn baby king. To know that he is the savior of all. Lord, be with us now. Just prepare our hearts in expectation for what the Spirit wants to do in this place this morning. Holy Spirit, would you have free reign in our worship, free reign in everything we do here this morning, right now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Let's all stand up together as we enter into uh, some worship time. We're going to sing some Christmas. In fact, we've got all Christmas music today. How many people are happy about that?
favorites.
rescue. And thank you for the healing that's only found in you. Draw us closer and closer to you this morning, God. Fill our hearts, fill our minds with who you are, the truth of the gospel. Thank you so much for who you are, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Church, I do have to tell you, for someone who starts celebrating Christmas in like mid-October, I did have a moment on Friday where I looked at the calendar and was like, I can't believe that's in a week. I, I, and I don't know if it's just the season that we're in. A lot has seemed to catch me off guard this year. I remember the 1st of December, I realized that in three months it'll be March again, and I'm still mentally processing March of 2020. But uh after not being together for the Easter season, which I, I did feel was very difficult, I am so overjoyed that we're able to be together in person for the Advent season. Um, and we're really excited. We ask you to join us uh, on Christmas Eve. We'll be here at 8 p.m. It'll be about an hour service, just like a Sunday morning. We're just gonna uh, sing some more Christmas songs and just uh, revel in the truth of who our Savior is and that he came for us in the midst of our hopelessness. And uh, like I said, I was bummed to not have our hymn sing. That's probably one of my favorite things that we do here. Uh, but it was, it was nice to enjoy a snowy, quiet evening to myself on Wednesday. And I hope it was the same for you as well, even if you don't like snow. Um, and I'm sorry for those who don't like snow, but I'm gonna continue to pray for it. Uh, <laughs> as we approach Christmas this week and put our focus on the miracle of that night, the night that our God willingly took on flesh and chose to be born in human weakness, not just to, to put himself in our midst in all of his power and glory and majesty, but to be born in the lowest of circumstances, in a manger that animals would feed out of. I can't help but be in awe when I think about that. And it's the driving force of one of the main truths that we preach here at Coleraine, that while we were of no use to him whatsoever, still he came and still he died. And the truth of the Advent season is we weren't expecting it. We weren't really interested. We weren't really involved. We didn't ask. We didn't deserve. We didn't help. And frankly, I don't think that anyone alive in his age could have imagined how God was going to send his Messiah and what that was going to look like. But still, this week and forevermore, we get to proclaim the truth said in Isaiah that to us a child is born and a son is given. And that's one of the most powerful and profound truths of the Christian faith, that to us a son is given. And this morning, I want us to see from the Christmas story that Jesus didn't come just for a few. He didn't just come for those that he already knew would believe. He came here and took on flesh for the whole world. And as a result, our world has never been the same and our lives would never be the same. Jesus' coming to earth echoes the truth that he would proclaim some 33 odd years later as he was on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Only in the sacrifice of Jesus, in his coming to earth in the first place, do we get some kind of picture of just how far away we were from the Father as mankind. Only in Jesus do we see the true weight and penalty of the separation that sin had caused at the fall back in Genesis. And only in Jesus do we see that truth that where sin abounded and sin did abound, grace abounded all the more in him. And in order for us to see that truth more clearly from the, the Advent story, what it means for us as a result, how it should affect how we live our lives right now, I want to look at the Christmas story from the perspective of three different people this morning. Three people that this, this event had a very different impact on, but all three show us different truths about his arrival, about his coming. The first person I want to look at this morning is the villain of our story, King Herod. The one so desperate to hold on to his earthly power that the desire of his heart was to end the life of a newborn baby boy. And in that pursuit, he had many other children put to death. Look with me at his story beginning in Matthew chapter two, right at the beginning of Matthew chapter two. 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, when it, saying where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. The news of the Messiah, news that was long awaited by the Jewish people. A new king who had been prophesied hundreds of years earlier was not good news to Herod. And as we see from this passage, it was not good news to a people group, the Jews, who had become comfortable with their current political situation. It says that Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. We weren't expecting it anymore. It was news that troubled him because like many other earthly kings, leaders still in power today, frankly, his greatest attachment, the, the biggest idol in the heart of Herod was his power, his throne, and his influence. And Herod is willing to go to great lengths to hold on to it. Verse seven, Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search dil diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. We see this lie from Herod. This man so consumed by holding on to his own power and his throne that many times throughout his life in recorded history, we read that he was willing to have his own family, even his own sons, killed because of a paranoid suspicion of suspected disloyalty. Herod is a paranoid shell of a real man who sits as king. With his words, he said he wanted to worship, but in his heart, he sought to kill. He feigns worship, but the intent of his heart is to end the life of the newborn Jesus when it's barely began. Herod has nothing but hatred and darkness in his heart because it's a heart that's lost in sin and separated from the God who created him, the same God who seeks to save him. Verse 12, the wise men have found Jesus, this infant king, this son of Mary. They've found the word made flesh. But then they're told in verse 12, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. The true and genuine worship of the wise men is manifested in their obedience to this dream from the Holy Spirit. The dream that makes them aware of Herod's true intentions. The hatred that was in this man's heart and the intent of sin to end this young baby's life. And they do not return to him. And it says they go another route back to their own country. And we see one of the most wickedly evil responses from Herod. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And in all that region who were two years old or under. According to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Herod is indeed the villain of the Advent story. But my goodness, church, when we sit and reflect on King Herod, when we talk about and reflect on the evil that's in his heart, the intent of his heart to end this life, to protect his own throne and his own power, to hold on to earthly power no matter the cost, I pray that our eyes would be open to see that when Jesus came, to this earth, and when Jesus came into our lives, the gap that he bridged between us and the Heavenly Father was every bit as wide as the gap was between Herod and the Heavenly Father. Jesus did not come for the healthy. He came for the sick. And if we're not careful when we read the Advent story, it's really easy for us to do what the Pharisees do, did. We read about King Herod and we say, 
God, thank you that I am not as bad of a sinner as King Herod. Thank you that I've never sinned to that extent. Thank you that I'm not as bad as this king. But I have news for you, church. Before Jesus came into your life, you were. Because Jesus didn't come for those who already had it together, those who were already perfectly following the law, because as Paul tells us, he found none. He came for the Herods. He came for the Judases. He came for the sick, for the fallen, for all of mankind. He came for those that in 30 some odd years would stand before he and Pilate and shout, crucify him. Herod should be a reminder to us this morning of just how lost our world is and just how lost we were in sin and darkness before Jesus. Just how lost the world was in darkness before that light shone over Bethlehem that night. If Herod himself had been true to his words and did what he said he wanted to do, to go and worship him, he would have known the savior of the world that came for him. Because church, I feel we need to be reminded again this morning as we so often do that no matter who you come across in this life, no matter how messed up or how, how bad we view them to be, no one is outside of the love and grace of Jesus. Jesus came for those like Herod every bit as much as he came for us because we needed him every bit as much as someone like Herod would need him. And I pray that we would remember that in our own lives, and I pray that we would remember that in how we treat those outside the church, especially those who think and believe differently than we do. And then there was Joseph. Joseph, how easy it would have been for Joseph's story to end before he heard the cries of this baby boy that night. Turn back with me just one chapter, the Matthew chapter one. We're gonna look at Joseph's story starting in verse 18 and going to the end of the chapter. Matthew writes, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to, G to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this to took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. But when, jo when Joseph awoke from sleep, when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to his son, and he called his name Jesus. A key word for us to see here in this passage is that word betrothal. You see, marriage in the ancient world was a little bit different than we know marriage of today. There were, would have been three distinct phases to marriage. The first was engagement, and that looks a little bit different for us in our culture here in America. This would have been when the, these two were quite young, and this would have been arranged by their parents. But we see Mary and Joseph in the stage of betrothal. This is a, that's what's referenced here in Matthew 1. This made the engagement legal and binding and would typically last one year. And in that one year, they would be known as husband and wife, but they would not be married yet. And the only thing that could end that betrothal in that one year period would be divorce. And finally, marriage. This would be the wedding, and weddings would go for days or sometimes weeks. And this would be the ending event that would, would truly bind them together for the rest of their lives. Mary and Joseph, having not yet been married but betrothed, had never been together as husband and wife. They'd never laid together. So when Mary is found to be pregnant, Joseph's reaction is 100% understandable for the time that he's in. And he's a just man, Matthew says. He doesn't want there to be shame. He doesn't want there to be a public stigma or hardship for this woman, Mary, that he's come to love. Joseph, more than anything, probably just feels hurt by this. And being a man, that 
is understandable until his dream, his very first dream in this long and strange saga of being the man who would bring the savior of the world into it. Joseph, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Those are probably incredibly beautiful words to a heart that was feeling very hurt in this moment. But it only gets even better with that last phrase. Beautiful words for us to reflect on today for a world still troubled and wearied by sin. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It would have been an incredibly difficult decision for Joseph to walk away from Mary, one that I think he was dreading having to make. And while the joy of knowing that she had told the truth about this conception was a beautiful one, we must not forget that the journey of staying with Mary was going to be a difficult one as well. It's likely that his family, his friends, that the society around them would look down on them both. They would look down on Mary as a suspected adulterer, betrothed to Joseph, but with another man. And they would look down on Joseph and say, why would you stay with her after that? The truth that they knew would be an incredibly hard one to express, a hard one for some to believe even still today. But Joseph should serve as a reminder to us that when we're walking in God's will for our lives, even when it's clear, when we're walking in accordance with his Holy Spirit, when we know what we're doing is from God, we're gonna have to stop caring about the way the world views us or thinks about us. The call of Joseph in the Christmas story is one that reminds us that the call of the Messiah on our life is way too big, far too great for us to continue to care about what the world says about us. We see this in Joseph's great, 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 many times over grandfather David when he's dancing and worshiping the Lord and they're laughing and he says, I'll become even more undignified than this. The call on Jesus in our life is one that just like for Joseph here is going to rip us from our comfort zones and tell us to weigh the words of Jesus over the laughter and scoffs of the world. But then finally, there's that incredible woman of God. The woman that we looked at for pretty much all of the Advent season last year, Mary. The one for the sake of the world, for the sake of the Messiah, for the sake of God's redemptive plan, gives a resounding yes, even when his plan probably sounded pretty near impossible to her, like she was having a far-fetched dream. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. I want to look at verses 26 through 38 as we see Mary begin her role in all of this. Again, that's Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. 
And this is the sixth, sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, this is Mary's answer. Now notice, Gabriel's not posing this as a question, but we have Mary's answer here. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This angel comes with news that would radically change Mary's life forever. Mary will never be the same. The world would never be the same. Just like Joseph, those around her would never view her in the same way again. But Mary does not care about how the world sees her. She cares about the first thing that Gabriel says to her. She is a favored one, and the Lord is with her. And while Gabriel, like I said, never poses this as a question, we still see the earnest answer of Mary's heart in verse 38. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary's life, her involvement in bringing Jesus into this world and seeing the word made flesh, not just before her eyes, but conceived within her body, is proof that our God is faithful even when we can't see it clearly. Even when it feels like what he wants to do in our life is impossible. Remember for Mary, we're on a little over 400 years since the Lord has last spoken through his prophets. This has been a long period of silence. And when that silence is broken, he doesn't speak to a king he doesn't speak to a new prophet. He speaks to Mary. And he didn't choose earthly royalty to bring his son into this world. He chose a faithful servant, a lowly, simple girl going through a very normal life to bring a child of grace upon grace into a world where sin had abounded for so long. I want to read Later in that chapter, in Luke 1, Mary's song of praise. It's a continuation, I believe, of Mary's answer in verse 38, where she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She gets further evidence of this truth when she goes to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth says, Behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb, John the Baptist, leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And listen to Mary's response to this. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled, with, he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, to his offspring forever. How incredible it must have been for Mary to reflect back on the scriptures of the past that talked about the Messiah and to know that they were being fulfilled in and through her. Church, maybe you can't see it right now. Maybe things look bleak. Maybe this season of joy feels joyless this year because of circumstances or because of the pandemic that our world is in, but our God is still faithful even when we can't see it clearly. He did not forget Mary in her faithfulness and her patience, and he has not forgotten you. He sent his son for us, all of us sinners. 
He sent his son to disrupt the status quo and to show us the way back to him because in spite of our sin, in spite of our separation, he is still faithful. And the Christmas season every year should be a reminder of that that, that takes us through the rest of the year until we're reminded again and again and again. As the worship team comes, will you just have a time of prayer with me? I just want to have a time of silence here at the beginning. This season affects all of us so differently. And I just want to have a time of prayer, of quiet prayer for, for anyone who may need it right now. And then I just want to pray that we would leave this place this morning with the truth of this centered on our hearts, that our God is faithful. Will you pray with me? Father, this morning as we reflect on what this season means for us as believers, I'm just so thankful that you made a way where there was no way. That the, the baby boy that we celebrate in this season, born in the lowest of circumstances, would years later proclaim a divisive but powerful truth that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And I am just so eternally thankful for that. And I pray right now that you would center our hearts on the truth that we've seen this morning, that Jesus came for us in spite of our sin, that no one is too far gone, too far lost in sin to come back to the, the grace of a father who loves them. That's why it had to be Jesus. He came for everyone. Father, I thank you that his coming disrupted and broke the status quo, and I pray that you would do that in our lives. It's, it's so easy to slip into our comfort zones. We want to stay there, but we don't do any growing there. And I pray, Lord, that you would push us outside of our comfort zones like you did for Joseph. That we would stop caring about what the world says about us. If the world laughs at us, let us shrug it right off and know that your will is greater. And Father, for Mary, for the faithfulness of this girl, this young girl, this young woman who would say all generations will call me blessed because after a time of great silence and the faithfulness was being questioned, the faithfulness of God was being questioned, you showed that even in the silence you are still faithful. Faithful to remember your servant. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for her willingness to say yes, let it be to me according to your words. Let the will of God be done. We see her response echoed in the Garden of Gethsemane 30 some years later. Let your will be done. Father, again, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for this season. We just continue to center our, heart, center our hearts on the person of Jesus and the miracle of the fact that he came and made a way where there was no way. We thank you for this time this morning. Prepare our hearts now to worship again. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was in there thinking that, you know, this season, this Christmas season, and every day that I don't want to miss the reality that we serve a God who came for you and for me. 
and he enters into our brokenness. He enters into our hopes and he enters into our fears this morning. Let's not miss that this year. Let's all stand together.
invite you this morning to enter in, to just flood into our souls, flood into our hearts, flood into our minds, that we will rejoice in the King that, that came, the God who loves. And even as you died on a cross, you poured out your forgiveness, Lord. As you cried out, forgive them for they know not what they do. Thank you, Jesus. Fill us with 
with the truth. Fill us with your mercy, with your grace, your forgiveness. Go before us as we leave here. It's your beautiful and precious name that I pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Last night as I was reading back through the message for this morning and just reflecting on the person of Mary, I was reminded of the image we put on the screen last December during the Advent season. Uh, the first Sunday we talked about Mary. It's a painting, uh, not a very old one, but it's a painting of Eve and Mary standing face to face. And Eve is solemn and her face is, is kind of hung low in sadness and the serpent is wrapped around her leg and working its way towards Mary, but Mary is standing there in white, clearly pregnant, and with her foot crushing the head of the serpent, and smiling and trying to lift Eve's face up to meet hers, and it gives me goosebumps every single time I look at it, and as I looked at it again last night, as I was reflecting on Mary, those words just kept coming to mind, of his kingdom there shall be no end. And that's how it was originally intended to be in the garden, of his kingdom there would have been no end until the fall. And as I thought about that, I just kept praying, thank God that there was a way made where there was no way. But so church, as we leave here this morning, as we prepare our hearts for Thursday night, as we prepare our hearts for Friday, I just wanna remind you of that. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. And when, when the angel says to Joseph, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's leave this morning remembering those two things. Of his kingdom there will be no end, because he came to save his people from their sins. Remembering those truths about him, let us go. Go and have a great Christmas week, everyone. We'll see you Thursday night.